You know, one of the most uh, basic lessons or principles taught throughout the Bible is the prodigal principle, the prodigal principle. We see examples of this uh, principle uh, in Genesis and all through the Old Testament as God dealt with uh, the Jewish nation as they were faithful for a time and then they rejected God and fell into sin and then God uh, you know, went to bring them back to himself again. You know, the, the prodigal principle, the cycle that continues to be seen throughout the Old Testament and even into the New examples of it we see all the time. Of course, we read the most classic story of it in Luke chapter 15 as Jesus tells the parable of the prodigal son. Now the word prodigal actually doesn't appear in the Bible. It means wasteful. And it was applied to the story because one of the sons wasted his inheritance. And so therefore we started calling this parable the parable of the prodigal son. Now the principal lesson taught in all of these stories, including that of the prodigal son, is this. Stage number one, people who live by their own ideas or their own rules end up in rebellion against God. That's stage not. Now you, you get to that point in a lot of different ways, but that's stage number one. Somehow you end up in rebellion against God. Stage two, Rebellion leads to reversal. You, you, you can't be rebelling against God in your life and not at some point begin to feel the effects of that rebellion. And then stage three, repentance leads to restoration. Repentance leads to restoration. And there you have the prodigal principle. Now this morning I want us to look again at this story of the prodigal son and see how this principle works within this parable. Maybe we, we can draw some new lessons from a very, very old story, a familiar one. So let's look at the prodigal son. Let's think about this, you know, this cycle of the uh, principle that I'm talking about. So let's look first of all at the rebellion part of this story. Luke chapter uh, 15 Beginning in verse 11. It would be nice if I was in Luke chapter 15. Beginning in verse 11. It says, And Jesus said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. And so he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. And so the first step in this principle is rebellion. Now to rebel means to defy or to refuse authority. It's a serious sin because in the end to rebel against parents or to rebel against legal authority is to rebel against God who grants all authority and who is the final authority. And God gives some of his authority, if you wish, to different individuals, different groups uh, for the mitigating of sin, uh, to, to have a well-organized society, uh, certainly in the church. There is authority that God gives to certain individuals to guarantee that. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23, the writer says that rebellion is like idolatry because we set up our own gods and we set up ourselves as our authority. You know, when somebody says, Nobody's going to tell me what to do. That person essentially is saying, I am God. I direct my life. No one can tell me what to do. In Proverbs 17, 11, the writer warns, a rebellious man seeks only evil, so a cruel messenger will be sent against him. Now in Luke chapter 15, we see the natural signs of rebellion in this young man. First of all, the first sign is impatience. Impatience with God's timing. He wanted what he was supposed to get, but he wanted it now. The tradition was that the older son first got his inheritance, then you know, all the way down the line. But no, he didn't want to wait for that. He wanted it now. He did not consult God about his future. He didn't ask 
a God about how he can use his gifts. He certainly didn't consult the Lord about how he would use his inheritance. Maybe he might have wanted the inheritance to do some good somehow. But that wasn't the case. That wasn't the case at all. He wanted his inheritance right away because nobody was going to tell him how to live his life. Well then, we see another uh, hallmark, if you wish, of rebellion, and that's the desire to be in control. It's my life. I control my life. I control my destiny. The arrogance of thinking that we own our lives, that we own our bodies, not realizing that God gives us our every breath, every single breath we take, God gives it to us. It's the height of arrogance to say, I own my body, I decide. Another sign of rebellion, irresponsibility and carelessness. You know, friends, fun, freedom. Refusal to submit even to the rules of common sense about saving and preparing and caring for oneself. This boy lived in the world and rejected his family, rejected his church, rejected his God, rejected his own parents. Because he was saying to his father, you're not going to tell me what to do. And then of course, another sign of rebellion, moral lapse, moral decay, moral decline. Rebellion opens the door to immorality. When you live by your own rules, then you are living by Satan's rules because if, because if God isn't controlling you, you can be sure that Satan is controlling you. We need to realize that there is no such thing as absolute freedom. Either God controls us or Satan controls us. One or the other. We're living in a fool's paradise if we think for a moment that we control us. So if you live in and for the world, a lot of what Duane was talking about this morning, if you live in and for the world, then you become like the world. And so once the rebellion is complete, then step two in the process usually begin to happen. And step two are the reversals. Verses 14 to 16, read with me please. It says, now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that field, excuse me, citizens of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating and no one was giving anything to him. And so now Jesus describes the reversals. You know, first the rebellion, now comes the reversals. Just because a person rejects God does not mean that God abandons that person. He is much more trustworthy and loyal to us than we are to him. Sometimes God gets your attention by allowing you to suffer the consequences of your rebellion. You want to rebel? Have at it, my boy. You can rebel against God, but you cannot overthrow God. Your rebellion will always end in failure, always. Because he is always in charge. Isn't that what Satan tried to do? The son, now hurting, but still in rebellion, turns to a stranger for help rather than turning to God or to his father. But God would not allow anyone to rescue him because that rescue would only be temporary, only partial. You know, many people are only partially rescued. They save themselves from their troubles. 
They save themselves from their addictions. They save themselves from their demons, but they are never really healed from the true cause of their problems, which is rebellion against God. And in this case, God will not allow rescue because God is waiting for the next step. Notice he said, nobody, they wouldn't even give him the food that the pigs were eating. You ever been there in your life? Where God will just not allow you to be rescued? So that brings the young man to the third step in the cycle and that is repentance. Rebellion, reversal, repentance. Verse 17 in the parable says, but when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The boy left his senses when he rebelled. And repentance means that he returned to his senses. A rescue would have solved the immediate problem, but would have left the boy still as a rebel. Sometimes we need a crisis to help us come to our senses. Repentance means to turn around. And so the boy faced away from God in his rebellion, and now he turns back to face God and what God has required of him. And in his repentance, we see the nature of true repentance and what true repentance actually requires. True repentance requires the acknowledgement of our actions. This means I really admit what I have done without any excuses. I was selfish or I was lustful or I was greedy. I was disobedient. I was rebellious. We acknowledge the thing for what it is. And we acknowledge that what we have done is really wrong. No excuses. No watering down. What we've done is bad and we know that it's bad. No buts. I really, you know, have to smile when I see a, either a public official or, you know, somebody famous or whatever who really messes, you know, they got, they get, you know, some DUI, you know, they're, they're, they're roaring drunk and they're driving and they run over another car or something and they get arrested and, you know, you see their mug shot, some movie star or some politician, whatever. And invariably, the comment, the PR comment that comes out is, I made a mistake. No, no, making a mistake is, you know, turning left on 9th Street when you really wanted to go on 10th Street. That's a mistake. Driving while you're drunk is not a mistake. That's not a mistake. That's foolishness. That's rebellion. That's sin. That's selfishness. That's egotism. Real repentance acknowledges that what we have done is wrong. It also is the acknowledgement that the crisis that we're in is the result of what we've done. Repentance requires ownership of the consequences of our sins. You know, we're in a mess because we've done wrong. Not blame our parents or society or some other person. We cho I chose to be at the bar. I chose to drink beyond what the limit should be. I chose to get in my car after so many you know, commercials about not drinking and driving and the statistics and, you know, it's like, it's not like we don't know that drinking and driving is dangerous. I chose to get into the car. I chose to drive when I can barely see straight. Repentance means I own the consequences. I lose my license. I go to jail. No whining. 
And repentance requires a decision that with God's help, we will not do this again. We fix what we can, we leave to God what we can't, and we go on with His forgiveness. Only when we've experienced this kind of repentance can we be ready for the fourth step in the process. And the fourth step in the process is restoration. Rebellion, reversal, repentance, restoration. Verse 21 says, And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. Now, <clears throat> the reason that the father felt joy was because the son felt remorse and true repentance. If it, it wasn't indulgence on the father's part, it's not like the father was soft or he was spoiling the boy. The father recognized true repentance and was overjoyed because his son showed true repentance. The father could offer restoration because the son offered repentance. You cannot offer restoration if there is no repentance. You know, some parents think it's uh, the Christian thing to do to offer uh, restoration and forgiveness without any repentance, but it's not. God doesn't do it. Why should we? It's also useless. Without repentance, the child cannot take advantage of restoration. It will only result in further rebellion. Now, to restore. This, we we kind of read this as an epilogue, you know, a little ending, uh, an appendage at the end. Oh, and all, it all happens, you know, a happy ending. But it's not a, just a happy ending. It's the core of the gospel in parable form. Restore means to bring back to an original condition. In this case, it was to restore the son to his original condition and position as a son in the family. So what the father did was a symbol of that action. The robe, for example, a symbol that he was now acceptable to his father in the home. He covered him. Uh, uh, with the robe given uh, by the Father. We, we see this analogy, this parallel with uh, what Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, where we put on Christ, we put on righteousness, that robe, the covering over of what is old and what was sinful and what was uh, rebellious. And then it says it put a ring on his finger, a symbol of his sonship, just like the Holy Spirit is our symbol or our seal of sonship when we receive Him at baptism. Ephesians 1.13, and Paul talks about that in Romans 8. Again, Dwayne, Romans 8, verse 15. And he put sandals on his feet, and the sandals represent freedom because only slaves were barefoot in those days. Just as we are freed from sin and punishment when we put on Christ and receive the Holy Spirit in baptism. Paul says in Romans 6 verse 18, having been freed from sin. We are free. He's no longer a slave. And then the feast. To me the feast is the most encouraging symbolism. The feast with the fatted calf means that the father gave his son the most precious gift of all. And that is, he gave his son back the right to be happy again. The right to sing again. The right to rejoice again. He didn't have to go on living with his head in shame, always defined by his past failures. How many Christians are always defining themselves by their past failures. The fatted calf represents the future. 
Yes, you were a rebel, a rebel. Yes, you messed up. Yes, you squandered what I gave you. But now, because you have the robe, because you're once again restored as my son, because you've been freed, you now have the right to be happy again. You now have the right to sing and rejoice again. It's the same with us as the Lord adds us to his church at baptism. Acts chapter 2 verse 47. We can now sing and rejoice with the saints forgetting the past, not defining ourselves by the past. So many of us worry that the sins that we've done in the past somehow affect us in the future. Had the father not made the feast, the son would have always walked around with his head down saying, yeah, I'm that, I'm, I'm that guy. I'm that guy that messed up. A lot of Christians are like that. Yeah, I'm, the guy that, I'm that guy that messed up. Yeah, yeah, I did drugs. Or yeah, I'm that guy that I, I had a divorce. Or I, I'm that guy that messed up. I, I, I've been to jail. You know, I, I'm, I'm a felon. I, I've had two times I'm, I've been to jail. I'm that guy. Well, I'm sure glad that God, Jesus saved me, you know, but I'm that guy. But the, 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 the parable of the prodigal son says, you're not that guy. You're not that guy anymore. You're not that person anymore. You're a new person and you look forward to the future. And if there's something that's joyful that happens in your life, you can rejoice. And if there's something that's good in your life, you can give thanks. Because you no longer are that person defined by your past. Of course, this was made possible for us, not by a calf but by the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, sacrificed for our sins on the cross by a loving Father who always waits patiently and lovingly for our return. Now there's more to the story, but I want to stop here because my focus is on the son who messed up. So as I finish my story and explanation of the prodigal principle, I'm compelled to ask each of us, where are we in this process? Are we in the rebellion stage? Openly or secretly defying or disobeying God and those who God has placed over us? Are we in rebellion against God or are we in rebellion against our parents? Are we in rebellion against our leaders? Are we in rebellion against our conscience? Are we in rebellion against God's word? Are we in rebellion against the elders? All people and things that God has placed over us, are we in rebellion? Are we moving away from God by refusing to do what we know is right, what we ought to do? Is that where we are? Are we in reversal? Is our life chaos, pain, struggle? You know, sometimes it's this way because of other people or circumstances, and we really are innocent victims, of course. But sometimes we need to examine ourselves, we need to examine our lives carefully to make sure that we might not be the reason for the trouble. Maybe we're the cause of the chaos. Maybe we're the cause of the struggle in our own lives. Is that where we're at? Reversal? Are we in the repentance mode? Are we thinking it's time to change? It's time to stop fighting God. It's time to just give in to Him. Are we like the sun coming to our senses and making the long journey home? Because if we are, then I say to you, don't turn back, don't linger, don't give up because bringing home a repentant heart will bring you to where I want all of us to be. And that is at the point of restoration. At peace with God, at peace with our families, at peace with others, at peace with ourselves, at peace with the decision to do the right thing. And so if you need to come home to your father, and then I encourage you 
Repent. Be baptized if that's the step that you've been fighting. And do it now. Or be restored through the prayer of the saints, whichever is appropriate for you or for where you are in the process. If you are a prodigal son, if you are a prodigal daughter, then I encourage you to come home now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.